I'm the Community Library Manager at AC Bilber Library. AC Bilber Library is proudly located in Supervisor Mitchell's 2nd District. In addition to featuring a robust selection of books, DVDs, and resources in English and Spanish, it's also home to our Black Resource Center, which was established in 1978 to serve the county's informational and educational needs by supporting research and study on social, historical, and cultural aspects unique to the African American experience. The center also serves as an information and referral agency to other libraries, government agencies, and the general public. In addition to our Black Resource Center, AC Bilbrew Library is home to the African American Living Legends series program archive, which highlights and honors leaders and visionaries of the African American community. You can learn more about AC Bilbrew Library by visiting lacountylibrary.org. Before we begin tonight's program, I would like to introduce you to our featured speakers. I have the honor of introducing Holly J. Mitchell, second district supervisor and chair of the Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors. As the daughter of parents who were public servants and a third generation Angelino, Supervisor Mitchell leads with a deep understanding of the vital safety net LA County provides to millions of families. Supervisor Mitchell is committed to ensuring that all residents thrive in her role, she represents 2 million residents across Los Angeles County's second district, which includes the cities of Carson, Compton, Culver City, El Segundo, Gardena, Hawthorne, Hermosa Beach, Manhattan Beach, Inglewood, Lawndale, Redondo Beach, portions of Los Angeles, and a dozen of unincorporated communities. In addition to the communities previously mentioned, Supervisor Mitchell also re represents Lemert Park, the neighborhood she grew up in. Since being elected to the Board of Supervisors in 2020, Supervisor Mitchell has made poverty alleviation a countywide priority and has anchored an equitable recovery plan from the health and, health and economic pandemic caused by COVID-19. Within her first year as supervisor and with support from the County Board of Supervisors, Mitchell passed a landmark guaranteed income program made LA County the first in the nation to phase out urban oil drilling, and has strengthened the county's ability to respond to mental health crises among our unhoused residents. Thank you for joining us tonight, Supervisor Mitchell. Next, I would like to introduce you to our very own library director, Sky Patrick. Sky Patrick was appointed LA County Library Director in 2016. In her role, she is responsible for the library's 86 libraries, 18 vehicle mobile fleet, and resources that are used by more than 3.4 million customers across LA County. Patrick is committed to breaking down barriers and increasing access for all. In addition to helping LA County Library go find free and initiating, initiating several other services to help provide more access and opportunity for customers, Patrick launched the library's iCount Equity Initiative. The library's iCount Equity Initiative ensures that library services and programs address the needs of the diverse communities across LA County. Patrick continues to reinforce the library's role in the community as a civic and cultural center, a hub for public information, services and discourse, and an institution of literacy, innovation, and lifelong learning. Thank you, Supervisor Mitchell and Sky for being with us tonight. Sky, we'll hand the program over to you. Thank you, Jeffrey. Um, and thank you, Supervisor Mitchell, for joining us tonight for our Trailblazers program. Before I get started, I'd like to take an opportunity to acknowledge this land and uh, do a land acknowledgement. Uh, we acknowledge uh, that this virtual event is taking place throughout the unceded territory and traditional lands of the Tongva, the Quiche, the Tataviam, the Serrano, and the Chumash people who are the original inhabitants of Los Angeles County. We honor and pay express our respects to their elders and descendants past, present, and emerging. This acknowledgement is, is to demonstrate our responsibility to lift up the stories and cultures of the original inhabitants of Los Angeles County as they, excuse me, as they continue their stewardship of the land and waters. We're grateful to have the opportunity to live and work on the traditional lands of the Tongva, the Quiche, the Tataviam, the Serrano, and the Shumas people. 
And with that, I am so excited to welcome you, Supervisor Mitchell. And I should I should uh, correct myself and say Chair Mich Mitchell. Uh, to this program, we started about a year ago because we had this, like we just kept seeing all of these amazing stories of leadership and just ownership and innovation here in the county that our staff was like, well, why don't we start interviewing uh, people within the county and um, external to uh, the county family and just so our customers get a sense of who you are. So we're really grateful that we could uh, bring you on. It was hard to get on your calendar. And so I'm really thrilled. Well, it's because you're busy. Uh, I'm really thrilled that you could be here for our uh, Juneteenth program. So without further ado, I will get started. I do want to make one quick cor correction uh, about the AC Bilbrew Library. It is the, the it does hold the Black Resource. Um, it is the Black Resource Center, but it's the African American, Black and African American Resource Center. So I just want to qualify that. We changed the name a few years ago. And before you go on, I want to thank Jeffrey um, for that very generous introduction uh, and for allowing and hosting me um, at AC Bill, AC Bill Brew um, several weeks ago. I think we're going to talk about that later, but it is a beautiful library. Um, it's a very small world. Um, Jeffrey's college roommate is married to a former staffer of mine when I was in the state legislature. So, uh, you know, while we've got a county of 10, 10 million, the degrees of separation are very few. So thanks again, Jeffrey. I've heard LA County be dubbed as the big small town. <laughs> Maybe that's true in this case. Exactly, exactly. So thank you. Sure thing. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about Juneteenth. And we have a lot of questions. I'm gonna do my best to get through all of the questions so that and, and make sure that we reserve some time for uh, our audience to ask you questions. So let's talk a little bit about Juneteenth and I'll start with a very basic question, which is what does Juneteenth mean to you? Well, <clears throat> you know, when you think about the historic relevance, we all know Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation 1863. It somehow took them two years to travel as far south as Galveston, Texas to let the enslaved people there know June 19th, 1865, that they were free. So, you know, you think about two additional years of free labor, when you think about the hundreds of years of enslavement uh, at no charge and how we built the core foundation of this country. And so for me, I fast forward that today, um, while I'm thrilled that the federal government and LA County have declared in holidays and people have the day off, I really think we should think about it as a day on, much like in my life, I choose to celebrate and honor the birthdays of Dr. King and Cesar Chavez. Although those are holidays, they are, they are a day on for me to do the work that those men um, laid out for our country. And so I think Juneteenth is very similar. It's an opportunity to talk about the role government can play to improve the lives of uh, the members of the residents of LA County. Hence our Juneteenth celebration that we uh, jump started last year and will host again this year at Magic Johnson Park, where there will be, you know, amazing food and dancing and wonderful cultural exchange and experience, but there will also be the exchange of information and resources. I'm going to push out government resources and information to people in the community who may need it. We're coming to the community to bring folks information that I hope can help improve their lives. So that's how I have chosen to acknowledge its relevance today. Um, uh, I think it's important. And for people to use the opportunity, particularly in this climate sky where critical race theory has been misrepresented and um, misrepresented, <laughs> Uh, I, I remember the discussions when I was in the state legislature in our effort to require ethnic studies as a graduation requirement at the collegiate level and now in, in high school since I left. And so this is an opportunity to teach American history um, and what Juneteenth was about and the blood, sweat, and tears that led up to both the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation and the Galveston, Texas enslaved people finding out about its passage a full two years later. 
Yeah, you, there's a lot to unpack there. Thank you for that. Um, I will, you kind of answered my next question, uh, but I think it's important to kind of tease this conversation out a little bit. And uh, the question that we have is, what inspired LA County to recognize um, this as an official holiday? Obviously, we know this is not uh, federally recognized. Uh, so what what is it what is it about this holiday that uh, inspired us to act? Uh, you know, I think that that there sometimes are a series of events that can begin a process. And I think some of the um, bias, as I talked about, you know, the, the national conversation about critical race theory and how it continues to bubble up and bubbled up in the confirmation hearing of our most recently confirmed um, uh, U.S. Supreme Court justice. It continues to bubble up at interesting times and places. Uh, and I think it's, a, it's, it's symbolic of a movement to tell the truth, <laughs> tell the truth about American history as painful as that may be, but we have a responsibility to tell the truth. Um, and so many cultures, um, um, uh, I had the privilege of uh, visiting with my son who was then maybe 13, um, the Holocaust Memorial Museum in Israel. And the focus of that museum is not you know, the history of Israel or the history of Juda Judaism is the history of the Holocaust, um, as painful, as graphic as that really is. And the whole point is, if you don't know your history, you're doomed to repeat it. And so I think that's what we've got to embrace as a nation. We To, to continue to deny the horrors of slavery is denying our true American history. Uh, and so I think the time had come, you know, the president, made a declaration at the federal level, which was a, a positive sign. Um, the, the county board of supervisors passed a motion last year, followed by the city of LA this year. And so sometimes I think when someone takes kind of the first step and kind of cracks the ceiling, it then creates an easier path for other levels of government to follow. So I'm glad about that. I think it's right on time, given um, what we're experiencing and encountering in terms of bias, implicit and explicit in other aspects of our lives. It's a good opportunity to pause and tell the truth. Thank you, Supervisor. Well, we're here at least tonight for some truth telling. So um, <laughs> I certainly appreciate yeah, that. I appreciate yeah, what you're sure. saying here. And once again, you kind of segued right into my next question, but again, I do think this is worthy of some teasing out a bit. Um, just talking about Juneteenth and the importance of Juneteenth. Um, in this polarized climate, uh, you've already mentioned it, all of the chatter and the unrest around what people deem as critical race theory, and you've already marked it, it's not so much critical race theory, but some truth telling around American history. Why is it important? Again, you've already touched it, but I would love you to just talk about that a little bit more. Um, you know, I have read articles and seen Kimberly Crenshaw, the brilliant law professor, who coined kind of the phrase, um, talk about how it's been completely misrepresented, just completely misrepresented. It was never designed as a curriculum to be taught in the lower grades. It's collegiate level, A, and B, they misrepresented its content. Um, and so it's really sobering. It's striking to me that there would be a concerted effort among a group of people to block access to information about this country's history. Much like in your world, the number of books that are now being excluded from public spaces, libraries and schools, you know, literature, you know, that is designed to allow us to learn form our critical thinking capacity and have an opinion about. You know, those are learned behaviors. I remember the first time when I realized, okay, I think I'm, I'm a grown-up. <laughs> um, I was in the Coral Foundation Fellowship 
right out of my undergrad experience. And a fellow fellow asked me in my opinion about an elected official. And I realized that I had heard my parents talk about this person. They held him in high regard, but I really didn't have my own opinion about him. And I thought I will never again be caught kind of flat footed that, you know, I'd gotten to an age, I think in school, we get caught in this thing where we're just going to regurgitate what's told to us to pass the test. You know, maybe hopefully everybody else doesn't do that. But, you know, I've had periods of intellectual laziness in my life where I was just trying to get by. Uh, we said we're going to tell the truth today. I'm telling the truth. We were just trying to. I'm here get for it. Grade, I'm here right? for it. <laughs> Sometimes you're just trying to get that grade. You're just going to get that grade and move on. Sometimes. <laughs> Never a truer word spoken. You know, and I remember thinking, she said, what do you think about X? And I thought. My initial thought was to be defensive. Oh, he's great. Da, 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 da. But I thought, I really don't know that. I don't know that. And so as a parent, I really try to give my son space. Sometimes that, you know, can be irritating <laughs> to have an opinion different from mine, but yeah. to understand the process by which he should arrive at an opinion. And you can only do that with information, information that's not filtered through somebody else's lens. That's a problem. And so to have, you know, mm. the blacklist of books because they, you know, use certain language or whatever, that is so limiting. And how are we going to have an informed, educated civil society if we are limiting access to literature, art, or factual historical <laughs> events like January 6th? If we are going to recast and reframe, you know, as a, a joke used to be, you know, my lion eyes. I, I thought I saw you that those are your lion eyes. You didn't see me there. I'm like, how do how do we let that happen to ourselves? So Juneteenth is an opportunity for us to pause and recommit, even on a very individual basis, to learning something new, to 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 allow myself to have access to information that I may not have had previously. Mm. Yeah, I love, I love that thought. And, you know, when you, when you're speaking about this idea of information filtered through someone else's lens, as you well know, and alluded to, this is right up our alley. Yeah. Uh, there's been a pretty immense fight historically, but even more closely this past year, uh, the American Library Association, I think you probably already know this, has stated that there have been more books that have been challenged this year, this year, meaning the last eight months, se I'm sorry, seven months, um, than during the McCarthy era. Uh, so this is this is a phenomenal moment um, in speaking of in terms of sp looking at things uh, through other people's lens rather than having the opportunity to look through you and make your own decision. You know, Sky, you're being generous. It's a dangerous moment. When we think back in history, um, moments like this, when movements began, where facts were altered, fear mongering Trump truth, um, we know that that led to um, the ascension of dangerous leaders and world wars. Uh, and the and the um, extinction of whole groups of people. That's right. Um, that's right. So that's frightening to me. Yes, again, I'm, I was don't know giving you the space. Right. Again, if you don't know your history, you're prone to repeat it. Okay. In terms of history, let's talk a little bit about your community engagement. I think this kind of this is a great segue into the work you're doing. So we talk about history and making sure that you know it, making sure you have the opportunity to look through your own lens rather than having to be forced to look through someone else's lens. I think this is important when we talk about broadening our community and uplifting our community space. So one of the things, one of the many things that you're focused on right now is this 
pretty cool program called the uh, Racial Justice Learning Exchange. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? And I know that, Jeff, I know you had one your first one at the uh, AC Bilbrew Library. Can you just kind of inform our audience what that is and why it's important and why they should tune in for the next one? You know, as we, uh, as a team, Team Mitchell, you know, I've been on the board now a year and a half in June, um, and and really we're, we're framing what our um, agenda would be. You know, a, a, a former colleague um, helped me understand when I was first elected to the assembly in 2010 that in my chosen profession, public office, you know your expiration date, the date you take office. It's an interesting kind of phenomenon. You know the date you term out if the voters give you the privilege of reelecting you to a full term. And so knowing that, what are you going to do? That's like on tombstones. You know, how, how are you going to define that dash in between a birth year and a death year? And so we've spent a lot of time on my team talking about our experience, our term. And being very proud to join a county um, with a board of supervisors that had the vision and the courage to pass an anti-racist uh, diversity and inclusion initiative, an anti-blackness initiative, to help begin the conversation of how we um, look at ourselves from the inside out, how our own internal governmental structure to make sure it is anti-racist. So we can therefore make sure we are providing services to the general public that are anti-racist. And so as we talked about that, we were clear that we wanted to do that internal work. I wanted to create space and opportunity for the appointees. When I was elected, I learned that I had the opportunity to appoint second district residents to almost 300 boards and commissions. Um, and I didn't see a consistent way in which my commissioners could gather or be convened or have access to me. So the original vision was to create a space for our commissioners to have this shared learning exchange together to make sure they understood kind of as agents of government or an extensions of, of me, if you will, in the community, that they understood this commitment the county has made to being anti-racist. Well, we put our first program together and it, we were so proud of ourselves. I was like, we should open it up to the county department heads too. This is an interesting conversation. And, and for me, the issue is too big to think you can do a, an event once a year and you're done, a one and done, a Juneteenth celebration or Martin Luther King Day acknowledgement. But that really is a learning exchange. We are coming together and unpacking and addressing our own biases of which we all have, right? and to have a communal learning experience. It has been so fantastic, so hard, so revealing. When you consider the diversity of the community I represent, to be able to uh, have one of our sessions uh, at a new county building in Koreatown, uh, leading up to the 30th anniversary of the uprising, to engage Korean Americans and African Americans about our perceptions of each other, our perceptions of ourselves, how we are going to create a LA County where we can all kind of grow old with dignity um, has been a really enriching journey. Um, I am a part of it. I too am learning. So this isn't a you come and you hear Supervisor Mitchell lecture. It's not what it's about. It is a learning exchange. And every month it's a different dynamic. We launched at Sony Studios with an amazing documentary that we've had a panel discussion. We've had facilitated conversations. We've had facilitators in diversity uh, and inclusion walk us through a series of exercises. Uh, we've had a lecture um, at AC Bill Brew and we've started up kind of a book club where we can share in reading experiences. Because I believe, Sky, that all ism, children aren't born with isms. Racism, sexism, classism, sexism. Look, that's learned behavior. And so we have the opportunity and responsibility to unwind ourselves from that learned behavior so we can nip it in the bud for generations to come. And we all need tools to learn how to do that um, and create safe space where we can learn how to do that. 
and that's the Racial Justice Learning Exchange launched by second district staff. And we're having a blast. Well, so I love that it's a learning exchange and I love that you really centered this idea is that it's a, well, it's an exchange. It's a back and forth. It's like right. a co-learning environment. Yes. Uh, I don't have because, all the answers. No one that's right. does. That's right. Um, I also love that. I love this idea. And I think many of us believe this is that children aren't born with all of these isms. These are learned behaviors. These are adopted from their parents, adopted from their environment, but we can change the next generation by being really committed to retooling this conversation, as you're saying, love it. Mm -hmm. So that was my big question about the learning exchange. Um, and this also, again, another good segue into sort of the more broad vision of Los Angeles County um, in your um, elected office. Let's talk a little bit about uh, building back equitably. Um, so we've seen across the county that just with COVID-19 and the pandemic has impacted vulnerable communities, especially communities communities of color. Mm -hmm. Would you be able to share with this audience a little bit more about Los Angeles County's Build Back Equitably uh, initiative? Like, what does that mean uh, for people who don't read the government news like I do daily? Right. <laughs> well, I'm sure people heard the president um, when he launched the CARES Act funding and the American Rescue uh, Act funding, talking about building back better, coming you know, how we were going to define our recovery from this dual pandemic, both public health and economic. And he talked about build back better. And so that really, for me, felt even more nebulous. And, and you know, I realized joining the board, I'm, I'm clear, you know, I'm a native of the district that I represent, which makes me so deeply proud. And I'm clear that COVID didn't affect every community the same. And so I felt deeply that these rescue dollars couldn't merely be divided by five equally because the pandemic didn't divide by five equally. And if we're really going to elevate the county, that we have to invest in a disproportionate way, just like we've had disproportionate experiences with COVID, systemic racism, Etc. Right. I was on a panel not long ago with this amazing young man, Pablo Rodriguez. Uh, the name of his organization is Communities for a New California in Central Valley. And he talked about unfinished communities. I said, wow. That resonated with me because, Sky, every jurisdiction that I've represented in elected office, from Hancock Park, to Little Ethiopia, to Koreatown, to South LA, to Compton, Watts Willowbrook. Everybody wants the same thing. Everybody wants a wonderful library in their community. Everybody wants green space and tree canopy. Everybody wants to have the opportunity to live, work, worship, and recreate and educate their children in their community. They want housing that is safe and affordable, where they feel a sense of community. That was very important to me when I moved back from Sacramento to LA when Ryan was a year to, to, to land in a place that I felt and he would feel community. That's what I felt growing up and it was core to my foundation. And so this concept of unfinished neighborhood is, the, is that although everybody wants those things, every neighborhood doesn't have them. And the role government can play in helping to finish neighborhoods, as opposed to blaming the people who live in unfinished neighborhoods for the conditions in which they live, right? So sure. to build back equitably is to acknowledge that we're going to use these federal funds that really have belts and suspenders and have requirements that we use them to invest in people who were disproportionately impacted with COVID. And so for us, it was how will we develop a system where we can use our ARDI, our anti-racist initiative, and, and Dr. Scorza and his brilliance and all of the data he's collected that really paints a vivid picture of who 
LA County is. How can we use all that data to invest in programs to help finished, unfinished communities? That's the best way I describe when we say build back equitably. Yes. Over invest in unfinished communities. Which will ultimately possibly actually level the playing field at that point. I, you I, wouldn't even, I wouldn't qualify it as possibly. I, ultimately, I think it will. Because when, when low boats rise, whatever that, when the, however that phrase is, if we can elevate the, the boat that's taking in the most water, <laughs> all that's right. boats will rise. I just that's say right. because I don't remember the phrase. Well, but, but, but we think we know what you meant. Yes. Right? We followed that. Okay. So some of the things that I took away here, I'm like frantically writing notes um, that she is working. She, along with the board, is really working to right size the disproportionate impact of poverty by way of how it affected, how communities were affected by COVID-19. Because generally speaking, obviously this is a general statement. Mm -hmm. It sounds like most of the communities ha that had the most impact, that were most impacted by COVID-19 were the more um, red line communities or even impoverished communities. I don't like saying that. I, I know there's a better way of saying that to, up, uplift that community, but it's it's escaping me at this moment. Unfinished communities. And That's there we go. I love that term. They're un, because, it, like I said, it doesn't blame the people who live there for their condition, but it acknowledges that they're unfinished. Unfinished communities are food deserts. Unfinished communities are, are housing deserts. Um, when we think about all that we now know about COVID, these were communities where people are our frontline workers who rely on public transportation to get to work who live in more densely populated communities, who live, have more people per household than other areas. Those are unfinished communities. And I think that's the way I, why I love that term because it doesn't ascribe blame or any kind of negative connotation that they're unfinished. And we have the power and the ability to finish them. So with that one, Supervisor, what do you think we can be doing? And I know this is a huge one because this this idea of building back equitably is really, I think, the bread and butter of this conversation. But what do you think we can do to develop more inclusive and accessible service models that make sure that people aren't falling through the cracks? So I am one of, I think there are now 39 departments heads and we are tasked by each of each of the five of you to really work to fill those gaps um, with our services and our programs. How do you see us doing that better? Well, I've been very impressed in what I've seen so far. You know that we've got a standing agenda item now at the beginning of every um, board meeting where we hear from departments report out about the programs they're rolling out that are meeting this standard, how they're using their ARPA dollars to, to build back. And we've heard amazing things like, you know, the, the rent relief for, for tenants, the rent relief program the county launched for small businesses. We know that 92% of the small businesses, a business in LA County have 20 or fewer employees. Um, we know how they struggled through COVID with, with mandatory closures. And so the uh, rent relief to our diverse small businesses was a perfect way that those dollars rolled out. You know, we're um, going to, this summer, we're going to issue grants, not loans, grants to three sectors, child care, restaurant, entertainment. You know, arts and culture falls in there with entertainment. Bedrocks of our economy um, that have some of the most diverse workforce that represent businesses of all sides, small, medium, and large to really make sure that we are shoring up the infrastructure of those businesses so they can hire Angelinos so Angelinos can get back to work. Um, the actual infrastructure bill that came out of the federal government, um, as board chair, I got to declare infrastructure week a couple of weeks ago. And I'm like that, you know, we're gonna make infrastructure sexy and, and appealing <laughs> <laughs> and broaden the definition of what we mean by infrastructure and using it as an opportunity to talk about mass transit 
and, and ways in which workforce development can be retooled to make sure that we are including our, um, what some would call our hard to hire populations, those who are formerly systems involved or formerly incarcerated, how to create pipelines to green jobs and the green economy and the, the new way in which we think about and operationalize infrastructure. Um, so, you know, those are just a few off the top of my head examples. You know, we're looking at meaningfully closing the digital divide and, and through our infrastructure work, you know, empowering ISD, a county department, to figure out what that means. You know, we discovered, you know, from my perspective, have, to survive COVID, you had to have access to the internet to work and for your kids to participate in school. You know what you had to do with the libraries to make sure people had access. And when I looked at the data, naively, you know, in my mind, when we say um, digital divide, it was that there were still communities that didn't literally have access to the infrastructure. No, it's that people couldn't afford it. 70% of the households in the Florence Firestone, Watts, Willowbrook area of my district, they, 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 they have cabling access. Mm -hmm. They couldn't afford the products that are available. So for the county to figure, to acknowledge that, you know, access to the internet now is basically like a utility. It's Election. an access to water and power and gas. We needed to survive. You needed to access information. And so looking at how the county can come out, and use these resources um, to make sure that everyone has access to the internet. That's equity in a practical application. Yes. You know, it's uh, it's an interesting, it's, it's great for those of us who are in the field of information uh, studies, information science, library science, um, because we've been talking about the digital divide for 30 years. And it's where I think the library has really shown and or has an opportunity to really show how we can affect the communities in real time. Mm -hmm. And I do see um, both with the focus of the board of supervisors, uh, making sure that you allocated funding, ARPA funding to the library department to expand our Wi-Fi out of our buildings into our, um, out to past our, um, Parking, parking lot, lot. Is, mm -hmm. a, is a huge, it was a huge material impact for the lives of people. So we couldn't use our libraries for a while, the buildings. So instead we, uh, we leveraged our campuses. Uh, so fortunately we live in Southern California. So that is something we could do uh, year round, but mm -hmm. we saw the opportunity to really push forward the agenda of immediate internet access for every person in Los Angeles County. So. And as you talk about you. How, what we do to make sure people don't fall through the cracks, that was your original question. You know, when county services and county buildings close, we, we look to the internet for people to be able to apply for CalFresh and That's access right. these emergency services. That's why for me, it is, it is like a basic utility. You know, back in the day when we would mail you your benefits, you now can get them electronically online. And I saw that shift begin to happen when I was in the legislature and began to worry then where we would mm. shut down, you know, call centers and, a, and direct people to a website to update their information, to, to, to file an application, to file their quarterly status report if they were receiving some kind of aided program. So that's why it's so critical to keep people from falling through the cracks. We have to make sure they can access these core safety net services and access to the internet is important. And so for you, I visited another library uh, in my district. You, you're going to help me with which branch it is, I'm it, hopefully, uh, where you did, you loaned laptops. We have it at many of our libraries. Yes, and I was going to bring that up. Well, that's, you know, I have to just throw it back at you, Supervisor. That was because of you and the board. You provided us funding to be able to host at, le at the beginning 800 We've now been approved for an additional 1,400 laptops and wife, um, MiFi is what they're called. <laughs> right. Um, so that we can loan them out to our customers. I believe we are the library with the most uh, mobile units for our constituency in the state of California, which is a good feeling. 
It is a good feeling. You should be proud. And I appreciate your leadership and vision in, in making that happen. You should be proud. Thank you so much. Okay, let me uh, move on to these other questions because I could sit here and talk to you all night about the digital <laughs> divide, but I think people have other questions that they want me to get to. And again, you had an opportunity to really talk about um, health care and information literacy. So I'll kind of move to the next question, which is, can you share with our audience um, information about the county's poverty alleviation initiative? I have read part of this and I am thrilled. I would love for you to talk about what that means and how it can help this initiative can help prevent and mitigate poverty among LA County residents. So uh, Jeffrey said in my in his introduction to me that my you know parents work for the county. They actually met as eligibility workers working for DPSS, and my mom was a you know Native Angelino, you know USC school social work grad, who had the fortune of timing and great mentors. She was very she was blessed. Timing in that you know she was a social worker in South LA. During the time of the Watts insurrection, as my father would call it, which was followed by a time such as this when there was huge investments in that community, philanthropy, federal government, it was the it was the that was the launch of the war on poverty. And so as a young child, I watched her write write grants and get really creative in, in these programs that they were administering, where she hired women off her caseload, you know, women who ultimately had full careers and retired. 30, 35 years as county employees. So that for me always formed in my mind what government could be. That if we were willing to be nimble and creative and visionary, government could fashion itself in a way to meet the needs of people where they are. Sometimes we get locked in longstanding programs. So why do we do it this way? Because we always have, but sometimes there are opportunities based on research and data where we can break out of the box and be creative. And so I think that early experience with my parents, when everybody, all the adults I knew were either worked for the county or they were on the county, <laughs> literally, <laughs> and that there was no distinction between the two, really helped create the foundation that's guided really my whole professional career from working for the legislature to being a lobbyist for the Western Center on Law and Poverty, to running Crystal Stairs, making sure that families had high quality, affordable childcare to allow them to go to work in school, all focusing on combating multi-generational poverty, right? And so my entire tenure in the legislature, that was my focus because I realized when we look at the data and we look at the, the number one reason the driver that 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 lands children in out-of-home placement and in our dcfs program poverty when we look at the role poverty plays in people being systems involved either in the juvenile system or the adult system at the county jail level or state prison poverty um and so from my perspective if we could curb that when we look at the disproportionate impact poverty has on our immigrant brothers and sisters on communities of color it always has seemed to me that if we could get ahead of that, you know, I was an early student of Dr. King's Poor People's Campaign. There have been seasons in my life when I thought I was born at the wrong time. <laughs> I was either born too late or too soon. Um, and, and the vision around the um, welfare advocates and all that they poured into the Poor People's Campaign, if we had done that work, 60 years ago, we wouldn't have our unhoused population that we have here in LA County. We wouldn't. If we as government and the private sector and the public sector had poured in with all of our might and consistently maintained a level of investment, we would be in a very different place. So this notion of a guaranteed basic income, you know, was, was really the ultimate goal when the minimum wage was ultimately negotiated kind of as a fallback at the federal level in Congress. But it's this notion that there should be, a, that everyone should be guaranteed a basic level of income for you to be able to take care of your family and pay rent and thrive. The brilliant young former mayor of Stockton, Michael Tubbs, had the vision and the courage to pilot it 
with philanthropic dollars. And the research that came back was astonishing that when you give people more than subsistence, they invest in themselves and their families. So coming out of COVID, we decided this would be a great time looking at the research out of Stockton and several other municipalities across the country to pilot it here in LA County. So the Poverty Alleviation Initiative is a way for us to stand up a program where we are going to house a number of these pilots. Guaranteed income is one. The um, closing the digital divide is another that will be housed in our pilot in our poverty alleviation initiative. And you know, an initiative is different from a department in that it's not fully staffed with lots of outreach and direct services like a department, but it's housed in the executive office and it comes from motions brought forward by the board. And so there are smaller pilots that we can test and see if these concepts work. And based on the research we've seen across the country, and now the fact that LA City, Long Beach City, West Hollywood, Compton have all launched their own guaranteed income programs, we're gonna be able to show, in addition to LA County, a thousand people, three years, an additional thousand dollars a month, we're gonna be able to really look across the board in multiple jurisdictions across the country to develop new poverty alleviation programs and ways in which government can invest in families and stop multi-generational poverty. I'm very excited about the prospect and what we'll all learn and how the way in which government supports people could potentially change significantly. When you think back to pre Social Security, pre-Medicare, right? Um, this could be revolutionary like those two programs have been for this nation. I am so excited to be a part of the county right now with Me this too. initiative. And I so look forward to watching this develop. And I am very familiar with uh, the, pre the um, previous mayor of Stockton and his, his work and just excited to hear that uh, we as a county are taking this step to really end, at minimum, mitigate poverty with the long-term goal of eradicating poverty and what that could do to all of these people who live here in Los Angeles County, the unhoused, the children, the elders, the seniors, uh, how that has a material impact in their well-being in their life. One question, I'm going a little bit off script here. Um, uh, you mentioned that um, it the PAI uh, includes the the guaranteed income and the digital divide. Is there a component of it around education? Out of curiosity, not yet, but we're building. Not yet. And so not the yet. initiative is kind of the shell, and we will house multiple programs as they come up. So the two, the one that we've launched already is guaranteed basic income and the work ISD and others will do around digital divide. It's a part of that work and data collection too. Fantastic. Uh, thank you, Supervisor. I have got to move on because I have a couple of questions and I want to open it up to the chat uh, so not to keep you. So yeah, I think this one's an important one. So nationally, we've seen a troubling rise in hate crimes and violence against community of colors, whether it's the mass shooting that we saw last month in uh, Buffalo. I could actually name several cities at this point, unfortunately. Um, and or if it's uh, the rise in anti-Asian hate crimes and sentiments that soared during the pandemic. So we grapple with this reality oh, that racism and hate are still very much alive and, pres and present in this country and in this county. What role do you see government playing or institutions in helping to build the pathway to understanding each other and, dare I say it, tolerating each other's presence and unity. So what? first of all, I hope everybody checks out the LA versus hate.org, the website. And you know, Sky, we have to decide that how we define a civilized society and then how we build it. We have to acknowledge that so much of those actions are based on fear and ignorance and how we combat that. We have to decide um, 
that it has become so pervasive and dangerous to the well-being of far too many innocent people that we are willing to take bold, courageous action. Front page of today's LA Times talks about the Senate got to a compromise on some aspects of gun control. We as a county are continuing to invest in mental health treatment. We as a county in creating this anti-racist diversity and inclusion initiative have acknowledged that we as a county entity are gonna do our internal work. Because let's be clear, Sky, it's government that has been the perpetrator of racist actions. When we think you mentioned redlining, um, we think about the Bruce Basic breach experience and how eminent domain has been used to keep people out. You know, I'm a third generation native Angelino. I heard my parents talk about how far west black people could live. I heard the stories my mother talked about graduating from SC in 58 and becoming a new social worker and wanting to get one of those fabulous new apartments in the jungle, the brand new all apartment high end living and, and showing up with a completed application and being told we just rented the apartment and having her white classmates go right behind her and get the apartment. I mean, in my own lifetime. And so, you know, government has played a role when we, we talk about infrastructure, the whole freeway construction in our community, we know how the Santa Monica Freeway bifurcated, destroyed um, West Adams and so many influential black communities. We have read recently, thanks to Kristen McCowan, the city councilwoman in Santa Monica, about how the black homeownership homeowners community in Santa Monica was destroyed by the construction of that freeway. So we know what government has done to compromise our ability to acquire multi-generational wealth. And the Bruce Beach example is, is one. So government has a role to play to correct the wrongs that government engaged in itself. And I think LA County Thank you, Janice Hahn. It's been wonderful to be a partner with her. Thank you, Steve Bradford, um, leading on the state effort to correct that wrong. Thank you to the state commission uh, on reparations that are looking at reparations. So government is stepping up probably more tangibly than we have in many recent years. Is it a, a direct reaction to the hate we're witnessing, perhaps? Um, and that's the role government must play. Now, on an individual basis, Sky, we all have individual roles we have to play. You know, going back to the old, when you see something, say something, that we can never let behavior or comments go unchecked. Uh, when I moved back to Los Angeles from several years in Sacramento and my son was young and I was going to establish roots now for the first time as a parent, I made a conscious decision where I was going to buy my home because I wanted him to grow up seeing a diverse group of people like literally at our dining room table in his own house. Um, we have to make those conscious decisions. You know, you, you'll hear people say the most, um, you know how racist and how, how and not racist, how segregated our country is on Sunday mornings at eight o'clock when you walk in houses of worship. We don't even mm -hmm. work them together in far too many instances, right? Mm -hmm. And so as we tackle our issue of housing, how do we now literally build an infrastructure that learns from those historical racist policies to build an infrastructure that allows for inclusion um, for everyone? These are great opportunities, but we have to be willing to confront it. We have to be willing to do our own individual work Another shout out for the Racial Justice Learning Exchange. We have to find those spaces to talk about it um, and acknowledge our own biases and be willing to do the work to overcome them. Do the work. And um, I think that's a perfect way to um, 
as you say, complete these unfinished cities. Yes. Right? These unfinished neighborhoods, excuse yes. me. Having, yes. having government step up and finish these communities. Um, I have a couple of library questions for you, and then I have, I'm going to open it up really quickly. I'm going to just ask you one question, um, and I always ask some iteration of this question. Huh? Um, I'm not going to ask what you're reading because I know you have a book club. So I'm going to ask you what um, what book has impacted you the most? I've heard several authors from you. Like who who is it? Who do who is it for you? So um, first of all, I wish I read all the books I bought during COVID. You know, I had to say, oh, okay, this is that thing, and the stack. And then I stopped buying because I said, I can't buy another one. And, you know, COVID, you know, I'm not, I'm going I'm to say it this last time and get over it. It was just so overwhelming. I didn't do that. I binge watch TV, like probably the rest of the world. I saw more Netflix and Hulu. I watched more TV than I read. I'm sorry to tell my county librarian, I'm confessing my sins. <laughs> I also got hooked on of the, the lecture series where you could subscribe and like I got it for a year and I gifted it oh, for a year. Oh, the master class? The master classes. <laughs> so at least that's not as bad as binge watching too. <laughs> you know, mindless TV. The master classes were amazing. Yes, they and, were. And I would select things, much like when you go to the library that I wouldn't like, wasn't didn't think I would have a natural affinity to, but it's like, well, it's an hour. Let me just watch. And was captivated and learned things that that normally I never would. You know, the, the founder, the, the publisher and editor of Vogue, our brother, the the um, the ghetto gardener, the political ones, just amazing. The master classes were amazing. Yeah, they so, were confession. That's how I spent COVID. I didn't read all the books that I bought, but I'm gonna get to them. But I, I, I know you're gonna get to them, and that's okay. <laughs> I'm going to get to them. I'm going to get to them. You know, the, the book I chose for the wonderful opportunity you afford us where we as supervisors get our bookmark that and the poster hangs in the libraries um, in, in the, the county libraries in our district. And I picked Just Mercy, Brian Stevenson. It is such a powerful book, such a heavy subject. I bought it the year I read it. I bought it and gifted it to my entire staff in Sacramento. Yeah, because I told them I wanted them us to share that experience because I was in the middle of carrying a pretty heavy criminal justice reform, trying to right size the juvenile and adult justice system and reading about those real life, real time people, characters in his book mm -hmm. about the conditions that led to them being incarcerated and his concept of proximity which has influenced me from that day forward, that you have to be proximate to a problem, an issue, and a person to really understand it and for it to change you on a cellular level. I believe Brian Stevenson was really deeply changed on a cellular level based on his proximity to those men on death row. Right. And so this notion of proximity, um, I think both haunts me and motivates me in the work I do every day. So I think Just Mercy had a profound impact. Brittany Cooper's Eloquent Rage. You know, she, it introduced me to this whole group of young black womanist feminist theorists that are brilliant, that are so smart. It just makes me go, how can one person be that smart? That just intrigues me. And introducing me, she, you know, a history of Ida B. Wells I didn't know. Um, um, Polly, Polly. Netflix did a piece on her. She's one of the co-founders of Now. Really did the legal oh. research leading uh. to uh, one of the first, you know, black attorney generals did the legal yes. research that led to um, all of Thurgood Marshall. I know all my work. librarians are looking this up right now. <laughs> Polly Murray, Polly Murray. Yeah. And in 1970, Polly Murray said, if you were to ask a Negro woman what she felt was her greatest accomplishment, 
should likely to respond, I survived. I survived. Yes, she I know that. The first quote. Black uh, Deputy Attorney General, um, co founder of NOW, um, introduced to her through Brittany Cooper and Eloquent Rage. So, uh, Fannie Lou Hamer, Fannie Lou Hamer, she's sick and tired of being sick and tired. Shirley Chisholm's unbought and unbought. You see a common thread, I think, in terms of my, non, my nonfiction. But these are life stories that I take from and really help inform who I am and the work I try to do every day. Yes, thank you for and that. And then, of course, there's my, my you know, tantalizing nonfiction, excuse me, fiction reading, like, fiction. you know, Sister Soldier and, you know, fun stuff like that. <laughs> you have to balance it. I'm not a very big fiction reader. I tend to also read primarily nonfiction and it's heady. But I will also, like, just affirm for you, at the county, we were doing a lot of work. We continue to do a lot of work. So that, like, fluff movies, TVs, Netflix, it was well deserved for everyone who works for the County of Los Angeles. I agree. I agree. I agree. I'm going to be like um, you when I grow up and say, oh, I, I only read nonfiction. I'm not, I'm not there yet. I'm yeah, well, I'm just, uh, yeah, don't, don't be like me. I'm an egghead in my own world. You, you stay like, you stay cool like you. Um, I have a couple of questions here, and I know I'm running over time, so I do want to be able to ask a couple of questions. Here's one from our chat. How much will you focus on voter education and, regist and, and registration at your 19th event? I think that meant Juneteenth event, especially in view of the dangers of losing our dem democracy when people don't vote. You see me holding my head? Yes, I do. <laughs> Oh, you know, so you know what? As I think about the amazing county departments that will be there, um, uh, you all, uh, um, public defender, we're going to, you know, uh, all the amazing county departments that will be there. I can't remember if registrar of voters will be. So I will take heed and make sure that we have someone there from that county agency talking to people about at least the mechanics of registering. I think we all have work to do to talk about general civic engagement. The voter turnout was at a historic low. And I'm not going to get, you know, in the politics of really? talking about who to vote for, but just right. given all that's on the line for all of us, the future, you know, leader of our city, just all that's on the line. Every election is important from my perspective, but this one was important. There was some major decisions to be had and we had record low voter turnout. Problem, it's a problem when the vast majority of those eligible don't exercise their fundamental right, a right that people fought long and hard. Let's be clear, women have not had the right for too many generations, nor have black people or other people. So, mm -hmm. We can't walk away from that responsibility. And so thank you to whoever posed the question. I can't remember if the registrar is on our list. If some staff are on and can put in chat, yes, supervisor, they are. Great. If not, let's call Dean immediately and make sure we have people there encouraging people to register. That's great. Thank you, supervisor. Here's another question. Um, what advice, and I think this is a good one. What advice uh, would you give to those who want to follow in your footsteps and pursue a career in politics. You have one of the most complex jobs that's known to women. Notice I didn't say to men. Um, what would you say to someone who wants to do your work? What should they start? What should, how should they start? So I get the question a lot and there is no single answer. My path was different from, from the path of others. People say, well, I want to run for office. So I say, well, what level of government? It doesn't matter. Actually, it does. I ran for the state legislature because I sat in a budget hearing and saw them make a decision that I knew would, would, would create irreparable harm to L.A. County and, and, and her children. I ran, became one, was appointed chair of that very budget committee, and spent 10 years trying to correct that action, that one billion dollar cut in subsidized child care. I ran for the county because the county is 
the level of government that houses the safety net. Again, we talked about poverty alleviation. That's what drives me in this work. Um, and so when you, I want to support and, and elevate and mentor and provide guidance to people who are of service. I am a servant leader. And you have to be clear about the policy areas you want to influence to decide what level of government you want to run for. You will never, people say never, say never in politics. I'm saying never, Sky, see Holly Mitchell's name on a ballot for city council. Those are noble, mm -hmm. important positions. It's not the policy work that feeds and fuels me. It's just not. It doesn't float my boat. So I think the best advice is to figure out why you want to run and what policy area, what problem you want to solve for. I wanted to solve for poverty. That naturally takes me to the state legislature and budget chair and to the board of supervisors in the largest county in the country. That's a straight line, right? People should figure out the problem they are yearning to solve for. That helps I you love figure that. out what level of government. And then you begin the process. I was a Coral Foundation fellow. Coral taught me the value of informational interviews. It taught me my learning style. It's listening. I'm an experiential learner. And so the power of informational interviews, I grant them as many people who call and want to pick my brain. I'm like, okay. Call my schedule and get it at the end of the day so we're not, you know, I'm not distracted by what's coming next. Have your questions ready, and I will pour into you and pour out as much as I can. Take what works for you, leave what doesn't. I support women running for office. Again, this concept of proximity. Yvonne Burke was my keynote speaker at my college graduation. That was the closest I got to proximity to a woman leader ever until I met Diane Watson and began to work for her. So my side hustle, which I enjoy, my unpaid side hustle is I'm the legislator residence at Mount St. Mary's College, all women's college, most of whom are first time college attendees. And my role there is to give them proximity to a woman leader. Not that they'll run for office, but I want them to be leaders wherever they are in the classroom, in the library, in the corporate world, in a hospital, in their community, in their child's school. So proximity to leadership, to understand and see themselves as leaders is very important to me. That's the kind mm -hmm. of advice I give people. Figure out the problem you wanna solve for and then build your base and your work experience and your history to get there. That is the best answer I think I've ever heard. And I'm not just I saying think that that's, because I think you're that's here. the best answer I've ever given to that question, actually. Figure out the problem you want to solve. Yeah. Okay. Well, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna put a pin in that. I also took a quick note here. Get on Holly Mitchell's calendar at 4:30 to 4:45 for experiential learning. <laughs> um Thank you, Supervisor. This has been such a great conversation. I would keep talking. I have tons of other questions, but we are at time. And maybe, I want to maybe, you'll invite your time. Another, maybe you'll invite me another time, or I will invite you to join me on just sipping my tea, and we can continue. This time, the role will be reversed, and I'll ask you questions, and we can continue <laughs> the conversation. Well, I've seen sipping my tea. Um, I've tuned in a couple of times, once with my daughter, and I thought, wow, that's a really cool idea. In fact, I wonder if that's where we got this idea from. You never be afraid to steal a good idea. Just make sure you cite it. <laughs> uh, you know, steal away, steal away. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Chair Mitchell. Uh, we certainly appreciate you coming and having this conversation. I wanna thank everyone who tuned in today, as said at the beginning of this,